Hello. In this video, we are going to look at solving differential equations using Laplace transforms. So the first thing that we need to look at if we're going to solve a differential equation using Laplace transforms is we need to be able to go through and transform a derivative, right? Differential equations are made up of the derivative of functions. And so we're going to need to be able to transform a derivative to solve a equation that contains derivatives. Now, in the last video, we went through and we looked at how to transform regular functions. And so once we, once we can transform regular functions and we can transform derivatives, then we'll have all the tools that we need to be able to go through and solve a differential equation by transforming it. Okay, so that's gonna be our first, first goal is to um, solve, well, not solve, but uh, transform derivatives. Okay, and to go through and do that, what we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to state a theorem. Suppose f is continuous. And f prime is piecewise continuous. on zero to A for any A. Also, suppose K, A, and M exist such that the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to ke to the a t for t greater than or equal to m. Assuming we have that, then we can go through and say the Laplace transform of a derivative is equal to S times the Laplace transform of the antiderivative <coughs> okay uh, for s greater than a almost forgot so what does this say uh, what are the conditions we need to have f needs to be continuous. Well, I, let's, let's actually, we should probably start with the derivative because that's what we're trying to transform here. We're transforming a derivative. So that's kind of the central thing is the derivative. So the derivative itself needs to be piecewise continuous. That is consistent with the last section where we went through and discussed how to transform functions. We said specific functions in that case, uh, if we want to transform sine t or cosine t or e to the t, um, then the underlying function, the specific function that we're transforming need to be piecewise continuous. So it makes sense that if we're going to go through and transform a derivative, uh, that, that, that that derivative, that thing needs to be also be piecewise continuous. Um, also, <clears throat> the underlying function needs to be continuous. So we're going to end up using that in the proof. So that is a necessary condition. So if you have a um, function, the derivative that you're trying to transform, if that's piecewise continuous, but the underlying function is not continuous, then this will not work, as you will see in the proof. The proof requires continuity. Uh, in addition, the underlying function needs to be uh, you know, less than an exponential function. So that was also a condition from the last section. Although in the last video, we said that the function we were transforming needed to be less than an exponential function. In this case, the underlying function the antiderivative needs to be less than an exponential function. So that is a little bit different. Um, so that, that condition does not, ex does not, is not required on F prime. 
Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see that this is going to be necessary in terms of going through and doing the problem, um, but that f prime being less than the exponential function is not important. It's not part of the proof. Um, and and uh, finally, so what does the theorem actually say? It says that if you go through and you transform a derivative, then the result of the transform is going to be s times the, the antiderivative times the thing that you would differentiate to get f prime um, minus f of zero, and that that requirement exists for s greater than a, which is, again, similar to the last section where we were going through and transforming specific functions. All right, um, so that's, let's go through and Let's go through and prove that. All right, so to start, we start with zero to a. We have e to the negative st, f prime of t, dt. So since f prime is piecewise continuous, that means that if, you know, again, and we talked discussed this in the last video, but that means that what you can do is you can go through and you can break it up into continuous pieces that you can go through and integrate. All right, so, what we're, so that's the first step is we're going to go through and we're going to break it up into the continuous pieces. So if there are any, if there are any discontinuities in F prime, um, then because it's piecewise continuous, those can only be, you know, jump discontinuities. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into pieces so that each piece is continuous instead of just piecewise continuous, right? Uh, I'll, I'll say that again uh, in a second. So let's see, we're just going to write this out. All right, so let me say that one more time. So because f prime is piecewise continuous. What that means is that means that you could take f prime and you could break it up and so that each segment of f prime is going to be continuous on an interval. So f prime may not be continuous from zero all the way to a, but there are pieces that you could break it up into that where each one will be continuous. And those pieces, the split in this case would be at t1. So from zero to T1, we know that F prime is continuous and maybe there's a discontinuity at T1. And then from T1 to T2, F prime is continuous. And then maybe there's a discontinuity at T2. And so what you do is you just go through and slice up F prime at all the places where it could be, where, there, where there's a discontinuity. And now we're guaranteed that all of these things are all continuous. And, and, and once you've done that, you can then go through and integrate each one of these pieces um, without any difficulty. Okay, so doing that, um, the integration we're gonna use here, we're gonna use integration by parts and we're gonna set u equal to e to the negative st and we're gonna set dv equal f prime of t dt. So du equals negative s e to the negative st and v equals f of t. There should be a DT here too. Um, and then if you go through and do that, and we're going to do that for all of these. But if you go through and do that, the result of this integral, you, you know, integration by parts, you take U times V. So we're going to have e to the negative ST, F of T, evaluated from zero to T1. And then I'm going to write it below here, just because it's going to just, you'll see in a second why. But, uh, and then what you'd have is you'd have, so that's, u times v minus the integral of v du. So if you take, you know, minus the integral of v, so that's going to be f of t times du. Du has e to the negative st. And I'm going to pull the negative s out, and it's going to become a positive s like that. And so this is what we end up with. We end up with u times v, 0 to t1 minus the integral of v du, which is this, and then the s part here, the negative s is moved out front and cancels with the, it's supposed to be a minus integral of v du and then you get a double negative there. Okay, 
And now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing for all the rest of these. So we'll have plus e to the negative st, f of t, t1 to t2, plus dot, 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 plus e to the negative st, f of t, tn minus 1 to a. And then we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to have plus s integral t1 to t2, e to the negative st, f of t, dt, plus dot, 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 plus s, integral tn minus 1 to a, e to the negative st, f of t, dt. OK. And now what happens here? So if you were to go through and plug, uh, pl simplify, like plug, plug in the endpoints for all of these um, all these pieces up here at the top, right? So what would happen? You'd plug in T1, and then you do minus, and you would plug in zero. Here you'd plug in T2, and then you do minus, and you would plug in T1. And you notice that when we plugged in T1 up for the first one, it, we plugged in T1 and it was positive. When we plug in T1 for the second one, it's going to be negative, right? It's going to be you plug in in T2, and then you're subtracting, and you plug in in T1. And so this is going to cancel with this because here you're going to have a positive t1 plugged in here you have a negative you're going to have you know well, you have positive t1 plugged in but it's going to end up being negative because you're subtracting and uh the same thing with t2 for the next group and all the way right down the line and so you're going to end up with everything cancels except for zero being plugged in which would be negative uh, and then a plugged in which would be positive and so we're going to end up with e to the negative s a f of a minus e to the plug it in zero here so we're going to have e to the zero which is one we'll just erase that then uh my you know with but the, yeah i'll just write it up you're gonna have e to the negative s times zero f of zero all right and then what happens with all of this okay so we have an integral from 0 to t1, t1 to t2, tn minus 1 to a. These are all the same, OK? And so since, uh, since all of these integrals are the same and their bounds um, go from 0 to t1, t0 to t1, t1 to t2, through tn, to, TN minus 1 to a, um, one of the, one of the um, Theorems for integration is that if you have an integral from a to b of f of x dx, that equals the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. Assuming, assuming that the function is continuous, you can go through and you can break up an integral into separate pieces like this. OK, um, and so what we're doing here is, is instead of going from left to right, instead of going this way and taking a single integral and breaking it up, instead, we're going to go from right to left and combine it. And so what you can do is you can go through and combine all of these integrals into one integral from 0 all the way to a of e to the negative st f of t dt. And so we get. Our uh, original integral from 0 to a, e to the negative st, f prime of t dt can end up being rewritten as e to the negative s a, f of a, minus e to the negative s times 0, f of 0, plus s times the integral e to the negative st, f of t dt. All right. And then the next step, once we've gone through and done that, is to go through and take the limit as a goes to infinity on both sides. So let's do that on the next page. So we're going to have the limit as a goes to infinity integral from 0 to a e to the negative st f prime of t dt equals the limit as a goes to infinity e to the negative s a f of a All right let's go back all right so that's that's this and then here, I'm just going to go ahead and e to the 0 is going to be 1. So we're going to have minus f of 0. 
And then we're going to have plus this last piece, right? So it's going to be plus s integral 0 to a e to the negative s t f of t dt. All right. So what happens if we do that? Then this side, this becomes the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative s t f prime of t dt. This piece here, we're going to break off and, and handle separately in just a moment. I'm going to leave that for now. Uh, f of zero is not going to be affected. It's not affected. Right? Doesn't have doesn't have an a in it. It's not affected. And then this is going to become s integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative s t, f of t dt. This, if this, if you go back and look at our Laplace transform definition in the in the last video, this is the definition of a Laplace transform with f prime plugged in. So this is the Laplace transform of f prime of t. Uh, this we're going to handle in a moment. We'll come back to that. This is the definition of a Laplace transform with f of t plugged in. And so the only question is, what goes here? All right, so <coughs> let's go off to the side and do that and come back. So we want to know what is the limit as a goes to infinity e to the negative s a f of a. All right. Well. If we go back to the theorem, what do we know from the theorem? We know that f of t is less than or equal to ke to the at for t greater than or equal to m. So we can start off by just writing that. All right, and so once we have this statement, what we can do is we can go through and say that it's absolute value. Uh, we can say that the absolute value of e negative s a f of t right is less than or equal to e. Hold on. We're just going to plug in a. OK, hold on, hold on. So if you were to plug a into this, yeah, let's do this. Let's just slow down. Right, so if you plug this in, in this, in this case, we could say that f of a is less than or equal to k e to the a times a, right? <clears throat> so if you go back to the, the theorem, one more time here. So uh, zero is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to a for any a. And then this is true for any t greater than or equal to m. And so thus, capital A here is going to be greater than capital M, uh, since this is true for any a. So what this, what this uh, requirement is, is that the function is eventually less than an exponential function. And that eventually happens at m. And so we're assuming that we get out far enough that we're past M when we're talking about, you know, talking about capital A since, since F is continuous and F is piecewise continuous for all of, for, for any A, this stretches, this stretches forever. Whereas this is the, this requirement is just saying that eventually we get a function that is less than, less than an exponential at M. Anyway, so let's get we're we'll getting into the weeds a little bit there. But what 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 we what we can do is we can go through and we can say that once we get out to a, um, f of a is going to be less than or equal to k e to the a times a. Just basically take this and plug a into it. And once you've done that, you can go through and multiply that by e to the negative s a. And 
And at that point, you can go through and say that e to the negative s a f of a is less than or equal to k e to the a minus s. Hold on, let's do that a little differently. Let's do this instead. Negative s minus a. There we go. Okay. Uh, oh, and then times a, times capital A. All right. So this thing here, notice we've built up to it inside of the absolute values here, right? If you go through and take the limit as both sides of this go to infinity, if we take the limit as A goes to infinity of E to the negative S A F of A, and we take the limit as A goes to infinity of K E to the negative S minus A a what happens right so <clears throat> the right side here if you take the limit as a goes to infinity so a is going to infinity we have an exponential function that has a negative exponent where the negative exponent is going to infinity right because one of the things that we know is that we know that s is greater than a since s is greater than a that means that this is positive which the negative makes it negative and then so you have a negative exponent that's going to infinity so this whole thing goes to zero. Since this goes to zero, it forces this to go to zero as well. All right, and so that's how we can go through and show that the limit uh, of this ends up going to zero. And then back here, we can just pop in a zero here and that ends up completing the proof. We have S F of T minus f of zero. OK, and so that gives us the a way to go through and transform derivatives. This can also be extended to higher order derivatives. And so we could say the Laplace transform of f double prime of t would equal s Laplace transform of f prime minus f of zero and and that that extension just comes through a simple substitution right so the second derivative is, is f prime prime and so you're just taking f prime and plugging it into this previous result okay and so we can go through and extend uh this definition to second derivatives and third derivatives and fourth derivatives and so on all right so with all of that out of the way the main event how do you go through and use this to actually solve differential equations. Let's suppose we have a differential equation to solve. <coughs> Excuse me. bad allergies this time of year. All right, we've got our differential equation here, second order. Um, we do know how to solve this right from, from earlier videos, uh, but what we wanna do is we wanna use Laplace transforms to solve it. All right, so the first thing that you do is you're gonna transform this. So we transform both sides of it. All right, and then the way that the so the transform, because it's based upon an integral, and integrals can be um, you can end up distributing the integral over addition or subtraction, and then you can pull out scalar multiples. Um, it just means that we can go through and we can do the following. You know, we can inherit from integration the ability to go through and break up the integral. Uh, break, break up the, the transform over sums and scalar multiples. And then the, the transform of zero is just zero. 
Okay, and now we can go through and use the result that we just just came up with, right? So the transform of y double prime is going to be s transform of y prime minus y prime of zero, and then the transform here of uh, y prime is going to be minus s transform. Actually, we should do this. Um, S transform of y minus y of zero, and then we're getting minus two transforms of y equals zero. So uh, do be careful with the minuses here; that they can. It's very easy to make a mistake here. So you do want to you know do what I did here, which kind of put parentheses around this transform because you're going to take this single thing and you're going to turn it into two things. And uh, so you need, to be, you need to be careful with that part. All right, and now we're going to go through and transform again to get rid of this uh, y prime here. And so we're going to have s transform of y minus y of 0. And here you could go ahead and distribute this now. So we're going to get minus s transform of y plus y of 0 minus 2 transforms of y equals 0. And so then finally, we need to go through and distribute this. We're going to have s squared transform of y minus s y of 0 minus y prime of 0 minus s transform of y plus y of 0 minus 2 transforms of y equals 0. And then the next step here, and I'll, you know, I mean, this will become clearer why we're doing this in a minute, but I'm going to take everything that's not a transform, doesn't have a transform as part of it, and I'm going to move it over to the other side. So we're going to have s squared transform of y minus s transform of y minus two transform of y equals, and then we're going to move these to the other side. All right, so this guy, when we move to the other side, it's going to become plus s times y of zero. And what is y of zero? That's going to be one. So that's going to become plus s. I don't know why I wrote a plus s. Uh, that's just going to be s. All right, and then we've got a minus y prime of zero. So when that moves to the other side, it's going to become a plus y prime of zero. What is y prime of zero? It's just zero. So we can just get rid of that. And then we've got a plus y of 0. When it goes to the other side, it's going to become a minus y of 0. And y of 0 is 1, so we're going to have minus 1. And then finally, uh, we can go through and factor out, right? So notice how we have transform y, transform y, transform y. And so we're going to have s squared minus s minus 2 transforms of y equals s minus 1. And then we're going to end up with the transform of y equals s minus 1 over s squared minus s minus 2. All right, so what did we accomplish there? Why did we do that? Um, <clears throat> well, so once you've gone through and you've transformed the function over into s space, which is what we effectively have here, this is s, once the transform has been um, accomplished, we're going to have everything is now in s space. That's why we have s's. Uh, technically, at the very beginning, this is all all these functions. I guess you don't see any t's, but y prime, double prime, this is a function of t, function of t, function of t. This is all t space. Once we've transformed, we transformed over into s space. And then the goal at that point is to go through, once you're in, into s space, is we want to go through and try and solve for the transform of y. Why do that? What, what is it, what's accomplished there? Okay, well, the reason that we want to do that is because our goal is to solve for y. Our goal in the initial differential equation, we want to get, we want to know what the y is that makes this true. And so to go through and isolate as much as possible the y in S space, now we're not going to be able to get y by itself because keep in mind y originally function of t. So it's in t space. Once we transform, we're in S space. So we, but we want to go through and as much as possible isolate the y. 
And the way that you can do that is just by going through and doing algebraic manipulation. So effectively, what it does is it takes this differential equation problem, which you know has derivatives in it. And by going through and translating it into S space, we've turned it into an algebra problem. You know, So I've gone through and I've solved for the transform of Y. Now, is the transform of Y the answer? No, no, no. Y is still going to be our goal. We still want to solve for Y. But by solving for the transform of Y, we're just one step away. We just need to, at that point, be able to reverse the transform and get back to T space. OK, so that's what we've accomplished by going from T space over into S space. We've been able to take the problem from a differential equation, a problem that has derivatives in it, to a problem that's all just algebra, where we're just going through and manip doing algebraic manipulation to go through and solve for not the solution, but close to the solution, right? Not y, but close to y. And then at that point, all we've got to do is go through and reverse the transform, and then y will come popping out, because that's what we want to know. We want to know what y is. OK, so at this is this process that we went through here is going to be very similar in every Laplace transform problem that you do. So you'll go through, you'll transform both sides. You'll end up doing a bunch of algebra steps until you get the transform um, by itself, transform of y by itself. And then and then that's where the truth is, that's where the real work begins. All of this is just kind of busy work. We're just kind of writing out algebra. So the question is, what is the y? What is the y here that's going to make this true? What, what, what would we transform that would end up getting s minus 1 over s squared minus s minus 2? So that's the thing that we have to answer next. In order to do that, what we need to do is we need to go through and look at a transform um, table. Let's do that. All right, so here's a transform table. So um, there's one of these in, in the, you know, you can go through and if you just Google a transform table, uh, you should be able to find a, ta a table that looks very similar to this. Um, and so what it, what it has, it, it goes through and it shows, so in the last video, we went through and we transformed some basic functions. So we transformed one and we transformed it into one over S. We transformed E to the AT. We transformed it into one over S minus A. We transformed sine AT into A over S squared plus A squared. So we went from the, the left side of this over to the right side. So we transformed T functions into S functions. So what we're doing now is that we have uh, we have the transform of something equals a bunch of S stuff. And what we want to do is we want to transform from S stuff back to T space. If we could transform back from S space to T space, then that could get us the solution to the differential equation. And so the goal is to go through and look down this table and see, do any of these things look like what we have? All right, so let's just take a look what we got. We got one over S, one over S minus A. We've got some x squared plus a squared, you know, in the denominator. All right, so do any of those, uh, what we have, does that look like any of those? We look at that. The answer is no, none of them look like this. All right, so what can we do to go through and make it so that um, our, our, our function, our, our S stuff looks like the stuff that's in there? Well, what you have to do is you have to go through and, and perform partial fraction decomposition. This is a process that you learned in Calc 2 and sometimes in a pre-calculus, previously in a pre-calculus class. So that's what we want to do next is to go through and perform decomposition. Once you've done the partial fraction decomposition, what you're going to find is that your resulting function is going to look like the stuff that's in the table. All right, so let's go to the next page. So what we have is the transform of y equals s minus 1 over s squared minus s minus 2. And then so just one, one, one more thing, like just symbolically, what we really want is we really want y. And so what I'll frequently write at this point is I'll go through and I'll take the well, what's called the inverse transform. I'm going to do the inverse transform of both sides.
and then I'll get to this point where, where I have y equals the inverse transform of s minus 1 over s squared minus s minus 2. I like to do this because now I've got y by itself, and now the goal is just to transform from s space back to t space. So hopefully that makes sense, right? If you if the transform goes from t space to s space, then the inverse transform is going to go from s space back to t space. And so, uh, so at this point, we need to go through and just manipulate this in so that it's in a form that will look like the stuff that's in the table. And that manipulation is our favorite old partial fraction decomposition. So let's do that. So you've got s minus 1. To do that, you need to factor the denominator. So we're going to have s minus 2 times s plus 1. OK, and the way that the decomposition works is you go through and if you have a product in the denominator, so this might be something you need to go back and look up how partial fraction decompositions work. So I'm not going to teach that in this video, so you're going to have to look that up. But the way that you handle this, this scenario is you take capital A, put it over S minus 2, and then put plus capital B over S plus 1. And then once you've got to this point, you multiply both sides by S minus 2 times S plus 1. And by doing that, you end up with s minus 1 equals a times s plus 1 plus b times s minus 2. And then we can go through and we can solve for a and b by, by just going through and plugging in values. This is a very easy decomposition, so future ones might be a little bit harder. But you could plug in negative 1. That will cause this to be 0, which will get rid of the a. And then we can solve for b. And then you could plug in positive 2 which will cause this to be 0, getting rid of b, and then we can solve for a. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to do s equals negative 1. If you plug in s equals negative 1, negative 1 minus 1, we're going to have negative 2. Here, that goes away. And then we're going to have b times negative 3. And so we're going to get b equals 2 thirds. And then if we do s equals two, we're going to have uh, two minus one is going to be one. And then we're going to have a times three. And then uh, this becomes zero. So that kills the b. And so we're going to get a equals one third. All right. And then we can just kind of continue our problem over here. So now this is going to become y equals the inverse transform and instead of s minus 1 over s squared minus s minus 2, we can write that as um, plug 1 third in here. We're going to have 1 third over s minus 2. Or the way that I like to do it is 1 third times 1 over s minus 2. All right, so instead of putting the 1 third in the numerator, I'm going to put the 1 third off the side. The reason for that is because, uh, because when we go to look at the table, <clears throat> the table is going to look uh, like this. It's not going to look like this. All right, and then so we're going to have the inverse transform of, uh, of that, right? Uh, and then plus, and then for the second term, we've got b is 2 thirds. So we're going to have 2 thirds times 1 over s plus 1. And then just like the transform is based upon integration, so the inverse transform is also going to be based upon integration. And integration integrals, um, you can go through and you can distribute over addition, and you can factor out constants. And so we can rewrite this as 1 third times the inverse transform of 1 over s minus 2 plus 2 thirds times the transform inverse transform of 1 over s plus 1. And then the question is, when you do that, um, are these two things in the table, right? So instead of this monstrosity in the table, do we have 1 over s minus 2 and 1 over s plus 1? So let's take a look. Jumping back over to our table. All right, so the question is, do we have 1 over s, 1 over s plus 1, 1 over s minus 2, and we can see that if we have 1 over s minus a, right? So when you're looking to transform from s back to t, when you're doing the inverse transform, you're looking down this column here. This is where the s stuff is. And we're trying to go back to t here. And so if we look down this, do, do, do any of these look like 1 over s uh, plus 2 or 1 over s minus 2? Um, and yes, we have 1 over s minus a. 
Anytime you want to trans reverse transform a one over S minus a, it transforms back as E to the AT. So all we got to do is just figure out what the A would be. Uh, and then we can just jump back over to T. All right, let, let's do that. All right, so we're going to have one third. And then S minus two, we said if A, so in this case, the, the, trans, the reverse transform from the table is one over S minus A equals E to the AT. That's the way you could read that. And so uh, if we look at this, we have A would be two in this case. So we would get E to the two T. And then here, uh, the reverse transform here, A would be negative one to match these up. And so we would get E to the negative T. OK, and then that's why. And that's the end. I mean, the goal of the pro goal of a differential equation is to find the y, find the y that you'd plug in. And we ended up finding it um, by going through that process. So let's recap that. So that's the answer. All right, so let's try that. Let's re recap again, starting here at the beginning. So you start off, we've got our differential equation that we would like to solve. It's got a bunch of derivatives in it. Very complicated problem to go through. Well, it turns out that it's not that complicated using all of the stuff that we've covered in previous videos on solving second order differential equations. But without any of that stuff, you'd look at this and you'd be like, wow, man, how am I going to find something whose second derivative minus the first derivative minus, minus two times that function would equal zero uh, that has these characteristics, you know, these initial conditions? Very difficult problem to solve. Uh, we go through and transform. We, so we go through and we do this, this Laplace transform thing. Once we transform it, we can go through and we can use the stuff that we covered at the very beginning of this video to take all of these derivatives and get rid of all of them. And so we can end up boiling down this function, this uh, sorry, this transform, this thing into stuff that's all made up of y's and a bunch of constants, right? So once we get rid of all the all the um, all the derivatives, we can then go through and just solve using algebra, we can just solve for the transform of the thing that would solve the, the original problem, the y, the y, which is the, what we're trying to find. Um, once we've done that, we've gotten to, to the point where we just have the transform of, the, of y. We can then focus on trying to transform back. And uh, so that's what we just finished doing by doing this partial fraction stuff. And we could transform back. And once you transform back, you've got the solution. And so that's going to be a new tool for going through and solving differential equations is to start off in T space with a bunch of derivatives, transform into S space. The derivatives just melt away using the theorem from the beginning of this section. And then once the derivatives are gone, you can then go through and just use algebra to solve for the transform of the function that would solve the problem. And then all we, all we have to do is just then transform back. To transform back, you're going to go through and you're going to do this partial fraction stuff. So almost every problem, you're going to have some partial fractions mixed in. So this is, if you don't know how to do partial fraction decomposition, it's important to go back and you know find another video to watch to show you how to do that. Um, but assuming you can, assuming you can do some uh, some algebra, you can go through and get the transform by itself. Assuming you can do some partial fraction uh, partial fraction decomposition, which is just more algebra, you could go through and get the you know get the get the the y by itself where the where you're just trying to reverse transform some stuff and then it's just a matter of looking at a table so you've got algebra more algebra look at a table and we could solve a differential equation it's, it's crazy it's, it's, it's a really neat technique actually um, it's time consuming though and that's going to be the probably the the biggest criticism that um, students typically have is all this algebra takes time. This algebra takes time. I mean, looking up in the table doesn't really take much time. But if we went back to the original problem, if we went back to this differential equation, how long would it take to us to go through and just solve that differential equation by using the techniques you know, that we learned back in the previous videos, right? So 
what was it? So y double prime minus y prime minus 2y. And then we have y of 0 equals 1, and y prime of 0 equals 0. To solve a second order differential equation, we form the characteristic equation. And we go through and solve this as r minus 2, r plus 1. So we get r equals 2, negative 1. We get y equals c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the negative t. Then y of 0 equals c1 plus c2. y prime of t equals 2 c1 e to the 2t minus c2 e to the negative t. y prime of 0, we get 2 c1 minus c2 off to the side. Oh, hold on. And then y of 0, it needs to equal 1. And y prime of 0 needs to equal 0. So we're going to have c1 plus c2 equals 1. And 2c1 minus c2 equals 0. Add. These cancel. You get 3c1 equals 1. c1 equals 1 third. And then um, c2 is going to equal 2 thirds. Hold on, did we do that right? This should match with the other answer here. One third should go with this 2t. Oh, yep, that is right. OK. And then we could take that and plug that in, and we get y equals 1 third e to the 2t plus 2 thirds e to the negative t. And you can see we got the same answer. And we got the same answer in about uh, 1 tenth the amount of time. <laughs> um, you know, But the neat thing is, is that the this method um, to go through and solve uh, second order differential equations, the method from the last chapter, it's really restrictive. I mean, we have to be able to go through and have a uh, homogeneous um, differential equation for it to be a real short process like this. We know that if it's non-homogeneous, suddenly the problems become much more time consuming. Uh, whereas this process going from homogeneous to non-homogeneous, they don't really become, they don't really become much longer. Um, you know, so that's one advantage is that the time gap does start to close uh, as you get into doing problems that uh, are non-homogeneous. Uh, but anyway, it's still a, a neat method. You know, the fact that you can just take a differential equation and turn it into an algebra problem. That's kind of cool. Anyway, let's do, let's do some more. All right. Say we had, let's do a non homogeneous. So we've got y double prime plus y equals sine 2t. And then we've got y of 0 equals 2. And y prime of 0 equals 1. Okay. So uh, these problems, you start off, this is in T space. We want to transform over to S space. And you can skip some steps to speed it up here. We can skip the step where you distribute the, the transform. And we can just go right to a distributed transform. Uh, so here you've got, this is going to be S transform Y prime minus y prime of 0, transform of y. Uh, to transform um, a function like sine 2t, you want to go, you want to go and look it up in the table. Uh, let's go and we'll do that in a minute after we finish simplifying this. So we're going to have s and then here this is s transform y minus y of 0 minus y prime of 0 plus the transform of y. And so this is going to be s squared transform of y minus s y of 0 minus y prime of 0 plus transform of y. All right, let's go ahead and look up what the transform of sine 2t would be. All right, so now if you're transforming from T over to S, you want to be looking down this column. 
All right, and so we've got we got to find uh, sine two t. So sine two t is right there. So what it says the transform of sine two t is going to be is it's going to be take the two which is next to t. So you're going to have two over s squared plus two squared. All right, so we're going to have two over s squared plus four. All right, and so just like in the previous problem, when you get to this point where all the derivatives are gone, what you want to do is you want to solve for the transform of y. So what we want is y, but while we're in s space, the closest we can come to that is the transform of y. So let's go ahead and get the transform of y by itself. So to do that, we'll have s squared transform y plus transform y. And then we're going to move these other things to the other side. So when we move this over, so y of 0 is 2. And so we're going to have minus 2s, so that when we move over to the other side, it's going to become a plus 2s. And then we have a minus y prime of 0, so that's 1. So that would be minus 1. And when we move over to the other side, it's going to become a plus 1. And then finally, we can go through and we can factor out the transform here. We're going to have s squared plus 1 times the transform of y equals 2 over s squared plus 4 plus 2s plus 1. And then the transform of y, uh, we need to divide over the s squared plus 1. So we're going to get s squared plus 1 times s squared plus 4 plus 2s over s squared plus 1 plus 1 over s squared plus 1. All right, so we get to this point here. This is the same point that we were at here. So the next step, what we did next is we went over and did reverse transforms to get y by itself. And then we did a partial fraction. So that's what we want to do next. Let's just take this and jump it over to the next page. So we're going to have y is equal to the reverse transform of got this and this and this so you can leave them together if you want for now and this because in this case there's actually going to be some simplifying that we could do um, it's not terrible if you go ahead and break break them all apart right now but probably a better a little bit better idea to leave them together for now and then we'll break them up in the next step. Once, like once we do the decomposition, that's what I'm saying here. Do so you want to do the decomposition first? Okay. So we're just going to leave them all together in one big inverse transform, and then let's do the decomposition here. Pop it in, and then there's going to be some simplifying that we do before we actually go and look these up in the table. All right. So decomposition time. So we have 2 over s squared plus 1 times s squared plus 4. And again, you need to look these up if you don't remember how to do decompositions. But if you've got an irreducible quadratic like this, the way that you handle that is by doing as plus b over s squared plus 1. So if you've got a linear term here like we had before, like s plus 1, uh, then you just put a single a in the top. Um, and if you've got an irreducible quadratic like s squared plus one here, you're going to put a, uh, a a linear term in the top. So it's always one degree less. So if it's linear in the bottom, constant in the top. If it's quadratic in the bottom, linear in the top. If this were a cubic, then this would be quadratic. And that's how it works. All right. And so same, and again, this is also an irreducible quadratic. And so we uh, go ahead and use CS plus D here in the top. Multiply both sides. You're going to get 2 equals AS plus B times S squared plus 4. And then CS plus D times S squared plus 1. OK, so this, this algebra problem here that we have left 
much, much harder to solve than the last one. So the last one, you could just plug in values and things would cancel and it enable you to get A uh, and B quite easily. Here, we need to find A, B, C, and D. And if you look at this, nothing really canceled. I guess you could, you could, if you plug in zero, it would cancel the A and the C and you'd have an equation that just has B and D. Um, but that's not, especially helpful because you, it's not that it gets you B or D, it gets you B and D combined in some way. And so that's not really good enough. So um, if you're going to, going to go through and solve this, I would say the easiest way to do it in problems like this where plugging things in does not simplify it, it would be to go through and expand it and compare coefficients. That's the, the technique you could look at, think of it as. So we have zero s cubed plus zero s squared plus zero s plus two. And then on this side, uh, what would the s cubed terms be? If you multiply this and this, you'd get a s cubed. This and this is c s cubed. So we have a plus c s cubed, right? Uh, if you go through the s squared terms, if you multiply this and this, you get b s squared, this and this, you get d s squared. So we have b plus d s squared. Um, if the s terms, you'd have multiply these two, you're going to get 4as. Multiply these two, you're going to get cs. So we have 4a plus cs. And then you can multiply b and 4 and get 4b, d and 1 and get d. And so then we'll have uh, 4b plus d would be our constant terms. And by comparing coefficients, we get that A plus C equals zero. We get B plus D equals zero. So I'm just comparing them. We have zero S cubed, A plus C S cubed. That means A plus C has to be zero. Zero S squared, B plus D S squared. So that means B plus D has to be zero. Uh, four A plus C also has to be zero. We have zero S here. And then four B plus D equals two. And so from here, you can go through and translate this into a system of equations that's written in a matrix form. All right, and so the way that works is that you're gonna have first column is gonna be the coefficients of A, B, C, D, and then the numbers on the other side, the equal sign. So this is something that you should have seen at some point up to this point in your mathematical career is being able to go through and solve systems of equations. This is a system with four unknowns. So we're going to have A is zero, no A's in the second, four A's in the third, zero A's. Uh, and then B is the next column. So we have zero B's in the first, one, zero, four. And then the third, we're going to have one C, no C's, one C, zero C's. And then the, the fourth column, we're going to have, we have no Ds, 1D, 0, 1, and then dot, 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 uh, and then 0, 0, 0, 2. This is called an augmented matrix, and it's uh, the way that you can take a system and translate it into these matrix forms. And then if you go through and take your augmented matrix, Google reduced row echelon form, calculator, you can go through and put this into reduced row echelon form and it will effectively solve the equation for you. So you'll get ones down the diagonal and you'll get zeros below and above the diagonal. And then on the other side here, we're going to get zero, negative two thirds, then zero, then two thirds. So this is telling us that A is zero B is negative two thirds, C is zero, and D is two thirds. So that's the way that you can read this. And if none of this makes any sense to you, then um, you need to go through and look up solving systems of equations using matrices. Uh, that's the thing that you can, you can go through and Google. Uh, all right, so what we've done here, though, is we have found the four letters that we could plug into this. So this is going to equal, so it says A is zero, so we're going to get negative two-thirds times one over S squared plus one plus two-thirds times one over S squared plus four. All right, so that, that's the result of the decomposition. And we can go through and use that 
up here in our original problem. So we're going to have transform, reverse transform. Uh, and then we're going to have, so instead of this, we're going to put negative 2 thirds times 1 over s squared plus 1, and then plus 2 thirds times 1 over s squared plus 4. And then from there, we'll have, so that's just this. That's the result that we just generated. And then we're going to have 2s over s squared plus 1, and then plus 1 over s squared plus 1. OK. All right, so one minor correction from checking my notes here, and that is that in my notes, I did s squared plus 4 here and s squared plus 1 here. And so I've got the values reversed uh, over here. If you actually plug this into a reduced echelon form calculator, if you're doing that and you're screaming, I have the answer that's the answer that I have there is not correct. Um, you're right, the minus should be reversed. Uh, so this should be a positive two thirds and this one should be a negative two thirds. And going through and taking that into consideration, we should have a positive two thirds here and a negative two thirds here. All right. Sorry about that. So if you are watching video there for a moment and going crazy, um, hopefully that uh, has fixed the issue for you. All right. And then so finally, the last thing that we could do before we actually go through and do, do some reverse transforms is we can go through and we can combine the x squared plus ones here. So we, we're going to get 2 thirds plus 1. That's going to be 5 thirds. So we'll have 5 thirds 1 over s squared plus 1 minus 2 thirds 1 over s squared plus 4 plus 2s s squared plus 1. All right, so let's jump this over to the next page. And the other thing I'm going to do while I, when I do that is I'm going to go through and I'm going to pull out the 5 thirds and negative 2 thirds. And so we just have these you know, simple pieces uh, to go through and look at our table to try and transform. So we're going to have y equals 5 thirds reverse transform of uh, 1 over s squared plus 1. And then minus 2 thirds transform of 1 over s squared plus 4. And then plus 2 times transform of s over s squared plus 1. All right. <clears throat> so uh, once you've done all that, you then want to go through and look at the table. And we'll do them one at a time. So the first one. We want to find, is there a 1 over s squared plus 1? All right, so we're looking for 1 over s squared plus 1. We're just looking down the line here, 1 over s squared plus 1. So it can be a little bit difficult to see it with the a's in there. But if you plugged in 1 here, we'd have 1 over s squared plus 1. So that is a match right there with a equals one. And so with a equals one, we can translate back and we're just going to get sine t for that piece. All right, so here we'll have y equals 5 thirds. And then the reverse transform of this is going to be sine t. All right. <clears throat> Next, let's look, let's check for, do we have a one over S squared plus four? Is there a one over S squared plus four? Looking down the line here, one over S squared plus four. Well, if we look at this, this is, if we plugged in two for A, we'd have 
2 over s squared plus 4, we could go through and transform. So we don't have a 1 over s squared plus 4, but we do have a 2 over s squared plus 4. So what you want to do then is you actually want to manipulate the your you know your function your s function so that it looks like this it has to look like this so how do you do that well if we want to have a two over s squared plus four we could make that happen okay by going through and doing the following all right so i'm just going to multiply by a half here and then multiply by a two inside here and so you say wait wait you could do that yes you could do that all right uh, just like we could pull the two thirds out here, um, the num the the coefficient that's in front of the transform can be brought into, it can be brought out of, and so if we add a two inside and add a one half outside, those will effectively cancel, and we can create the format that's actually in the table. All right, uh, let's so let's go ahead and check. Do we have an s over s squared minus uh, s over s squared plus one uh, before we kind of finish up this guy? Let's look for that s over s squared plus one. We're working our way down here. s over s squared plus one. s over s squared plus a squared. If a is one, then yes, that one will work, right? s over s squared plus one would fit this form uh, with a equals one. And that means that the inverse transform, that's going to be cosine t. All right, so we're going to get cosine t. And then we can finish up this guy with one more step. Uh, so this is going to become minus one third. And then we'll have plus two cos t. And then we just need to look up what is two over sine squared plus four. All right, so two over sine squared plus four. Looking it up in our table. Two over sine squared plus four. That's going to be sine two t inverse transform that would be sine 2t and that's the answer that's it once you've done the reverse transform you're done okay uh, let's go through and do one more going to end up being a, another long video, but that's okay. So the next problem we're going to look at is y to the fourth minus y equals zero. And then we'll have y of zero equals zero, y prime of zero equals one, y double prime of zero equals zero, and y triple prime of zero equals zero. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this one is to show that this method extends beyond second order differential equations, which we know how to solve and can be applied to higher order differential equations. All right, so the problem begins just like all the others. So we wanna go through and do the transform of y to the fourth minus the transform of y equals zero. There's actually a formula um, for doing, you know, if you want to just transform y to the fourth all in one step that you can go through and look up. Um, I, I don't do it that way because I, ne I would never remember what the formula would be. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and break it down and it's going to take the whole page to do it. But you could really skip ahead and just do this all in one step if you just look up the formula. I'm, I'm too lazy to do that. And so instead, I'm going to spend five minutes breaking this down. All right. Uh, so the fourth, fourth degree, we're going to get S third degree minus Y to the third of zero. And then we can go through and replace this with s second degree minus second degree at zero. Yeah, I might speed things up actually if you just plugged in these as you went instead of waiting until the end. Uh, 
maybe I'll do that. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have S. This will be S to there as well. And then second degree, we'll have first degree minus. And the first degree at zero is going to be one. And then this is going to be zero. And then this would also be zero. Yeah, as long as you're careful, you could go through and do that. Um, I'm not especially careful. I probably, if I do that, I'll probably make mistakes, but. All right, anyway, this is gonna be S transform of Y minus Y of zero, which is gonna be zero. All right, so this becomes this minus one minus zero. Minus zero minus transform of y. All right, hold on. Did we do that correctly? Uh, this is a the downside of, of writing out, doing out, doing videos is you write out your notes and then you get, you're doing, actually doing the problems live and you're like, yeah, to heck with my notes. Let me try something different. Let me try plugging in. So like my notes have all y primes, of double prime and triple prime of zeros in them. And I decided on the fly to change that. And it's probably gonna cause me to screw this up and get the problem wrong. All right, uh, so let's take a look here. So this became this. Okay, so the minus one shifts over, the minus zero shifts. Yeah, it looks right, it looks right, all right, all right. Uh, okay, and then so what happens when you actually go through and multiply all this out, you should get, all right, here's where I'm just going to cheat and just look at my notes. Uh, what you should end up with is S to the, not S to the third, it should be S to the fourth. We're missing an S. All right. You should end up with S to the fourth. Um, somewhere in there, I'm missing one, but that's because I decided to screw around and change this. Um, I think maybe it's right there. Like that. Anyway, maybe you should just look up the formula for how to translate S to the fourth all at once. Okay, uh, we got S to the fourth, transform Y, and then you should have minus S squared, and then minus transform of Y. All right, equals zero. And then from there, you should get S to the fourth plus one transform of Y equals S squared. And we should get transform of Y equals S squared over S to the fourth plus one minus, minus one. Oh, good grief. I'm not going to start the video over after an hour or whatever it changed, but this should be minus one. I'm now making all kinds of mistakes. Moral of the story, be consistent. Don't decide to do something different, especially when you're doing it and you're recording a video. Okay, uh, so we can go to the next page here and do transform of Y. Let's, let's actually, let's do this. Uh, the in, Y equals the inverse transform of, what was it? S squared over S to the fourth minus one. All right, and then we get to that point and now we need to do our decomposition. And so to do the decomposition, you have to factor the denominator. So this is going to equal S squared over S. S squared plus one times S squared minus one. And then um, you can factor again. S squared plus one. S plus one. S minus one. 
And then you can go through and write this as AS plus B over S squared plus one. Of course, I cannot be bothered to do problems consistently between my notes and between. So I almost did the same thing that I did earlier. All right, so the way I, I'm gonna, we're going to copy my notes now. A over S plus 1 plus B over S minus 1 plus CS plus D. Could you do what I was about to do and reorder it and do the quadratic first? Absolutely, you could. But if you, you know, you just have to be consistent, right? So the problem is, is that if I'm going through and I reorder these and I do the quadratic first, then I get to the end and it differs from my notes. It's going to just confuse me. So I have to be consistent. All right. Once you've gotten to this point, multiply both sides by the denominator, s to the fourth minus one. And what's going to happen is you're going to get s squared equals a times s minus one times s squared plus one plus b times s plus 1 times s squared plus 1 plus cs plus d times s minus 1 times s plus 1. And then at this point, so you might be questioning, oh, well, which method should I use? We, we did two different ways. Should I go through and multiply all this out and compare coefficients, or should I plug in values? So this time, if I plug in 1, it's going to get rid of the A and the CS plus D. Uh, if I plug in negative 1, it's going to get rid of the B and the CS plus D. And so you can get a lot of progress by plugging in. So I'd go ahead and plug in. If we plug in negative 1, what's going to happen? Here we're going to get 1. We're going to get A. Uh, we're going to get negative 2. And then we're going to get positive 2. And then here for negative 1, this is going to be 0, which is going to get rid of that whole term. Uh, you can have 0 there. It's going to get rid of that whole term. And so immediately we could just say a is negative 1 fourth. And then we could plug in s equals positive 1. And you're go, you'll get 1. Get rid of that of b times 2 times 2. And then one there, turns that into zero, gets rid of that whole thing. And then we're going to have one fourth equals B. All right. And then from there, it becomes maybe a little bit harder. But uh, what you can see is if you plug in zero, it'll get rid of the C. And we already have A and B. And so by plugging in S equals zero, we can go through and get rid of D. All right. And so if you just do that, so S is zero, you're going to get zero. Here, if s is 0, you're going to get negative 1 times 1 times a. That's going to be positive 1 fourth. Plug in 0, you're going to get 1, 1, b. That's going to be another 1 fourth. And then if we plug in 0, so that gets rid of that. So we're going to have d times, plug in 0, you're going to have negative 1 times 1, so times negative 1. And so this tells us that. One fourth and one fourth is going to be one half. Move to the other side, you get negative one half equals negative d. And so one half equals d. All right. And then the last thing that we need to do is to go through and find c. And I mean, at this point, you could compare coefficients if you wanted to, right? So you need to go through and pick something to compare with so that has a C in it. So if you multiply this whole thing out, you're going to have a, you'll have a, a C for the S term. So CS times negative one times one, that would be CS. And then the, the S term here, uh, ooh, that, that'd be BS, I think. Uh, and then AS. Anyway, I think it's easier at this point to just plug in one more time instead of going through and trying to um, compare coefficients. Uh, so if you do that, you're just going to get four. And then here we're going to have a, which is negative one fourth times one time. Well, just let's, let's write it out actually. So we're going to have negative one fourth times 
what are we doing? So we got two minus one, that's one. And then uh, four plus one, that's going to be times five. All right. And then you could, same thing here. So we got one fourth from B. And then we're plugging in two. So we're going to have times three times five. And then if we plug in two here, we're going to have plus, we're going to have two C. And then we're going to have D, which is one half times. And then plug in two, we're going to have one times three times three. Maybe it was easier to compare coefficients. Uh, like middle of the, changing my mind in the middle of this. All right. Um, if you go through and multiply this all out, what's going to happen? We're going to have four equals, this is going to be negative five fourths. Here, we're going to have 15 fourths. Here, multiply three, we're going to have 6c plus 3 halves. And then we can go to the next page. We're going to have 4 equals 10 fourths plus 6c plus 3 halves. We've got 4 equals 5, ha five halves plus 3 halves, that's going to be 8 halves. So we're going to get 4 plus 6c and 0 equals 6c and so c equals 0. There you go. All right, so we got out of that, we've got that uh, c is 0. All right, so plugging all that in, this is going to become the reverse transform. Uh, what are we going to have? So we're going to have a, so that's going to be negative one fourth times one over s plus one. All right. Plus one fourth times one over s minus one. Okay, hold on. I need to move this. plus one half times one over S squared plus one. Like that. And you know, actually we could squeeze it onto this page. Sorry if all the busyness drives you crazy, but uh, um, I don't like to move to the next page because I got to recopy the whole problem again. So we're going to have negative one fourth transform one over S plus one plus one fourth reverse transform one over S minus one plus one half reverse transform. I actually were going to have to, I underestimated how much space that would take just to rewrite it like that. We are going to have to move to the next page after all. Okay. Anyway, that's almost enough space. Um, and so now it's just a question of looking these up in the table. So let's just copy them over and then we'll look them up. All right, what did we get? One of rest plus one. Plus one fourth. One over S minus one plus one half. One over S squared plus one. And pull reverse, reverse, reverse. All right, let's look them up. All right, so we've got one over S plus one. All right, one over s plus one. Oh, 
boom, immediately, as soon as, as soon as you look at it, we get the one over S minus A, that'll do it, uh, where A is negative one, right? So this would be one over S plus one if we make A negative one. So we're gonna have E to the negative T. All right. And then and we just looked at it. So I don't know that we really need to jump over again for one over S minus one. It's going to be the same thing, except where A is going to be positive one. So we're going to have E to the T. And then we're left with one over S squared plus one. I think we did that one earlier and it's like sine T, but let's just take a look at it again. One over S squared plus one. 1 over s squared plus 1. That would be this form where a is 1. And yeah, sure enough, we do get sine of t. And that's the answer. Once you transform back, that's the answer. It's like magic, right? We start off with a uh, differential equation with a bunch of derivatives. Yeah, these are really long problems. They start off with a bunch of derivatives, do some algebra, get to the point where you have the solution hidden inside of a transform, and then you just need to reverse the transform and you got the answer. So we spent a couple of pages reversing the transform and there you go, it's reversed and the answer pops out. All right, so that's how you go through and solve differential equations using Laplace transforms. Thanks for watching. See you next time.